most revealing aspects of my researches into magic and the occult has been the discovery that actually magic has quite a lot in common with fiction and with fantasy. We almost get to the notion that the two are pretty well interchangeable. I think that Alistair Crowley even mentioned that the language of magic is more about language than it is about magic. The idea of a grimoire, a dark book of spells. Grimoire is simply another way of spelling grammar. Uh, according to Crowley, to cast a spell is simply to spell. When we think of the fact that most of the magic gods that various cultures have created or worshipped in the past, characters like Hermes, Mercury, Thoth, these are not only the gods of magic, they are also the scribe gods. They are the gods of writing. To some degree, the reason that I involved myself with magic was partly because as a writer, I was feeling that something to do with the territory of writing itself, the way that anybody who's been writing for a, a, a given length of time will probably have anecdotes to tell you, strange little coincidences, things that they wrote and then something very similar happened to them, perhaps a day, perhaps a month, perhaps 10 years later, that there are these odd little incidents that tend to build up and that you tend to shove in a filing drawer just marked weird stuff and because you have nowhere else to put them. You know, there is no other compartment within your life, no other context into which you can fit these strange little anomalous events, these little synchronicities. And eventually, as with myself, you might reach a point where you perhaps decide that the stuff in the drawer marked weird stuff is in fact the only important stuff. And that if you wish to progress as a writer beyond mere technique, then you might be advised to start looking at some of those events. This leads to a consideration of the relationship between fiction and reality. I started to come to the conclusion that fiction has an immaterial reality that is exactly equivalent to material reality. It is no less or more real, it is simply different. For example, we have a three-dimensional solid material chair, such as the one that I'm sitting in. This is real in material terms. Then we have the idea of a chair. The idea of a chair is perhaps more important than any single individual chair. And yet the idea of a chair exists nowhere in the physical universe. It cannot be measured in a laboratory. It is completely outside the realm of science as are all of our thoughts, all of our internal events. To some degree, the things that happen in our heads are the only things that we can ever know with any certainty. And yet these are precisely the things that science is by its very nature completely incapable of dealing with. Science, I think, would very often rather disprove consciousness on some basic level, would rather demonstrate that consciousness and awareness were a byproduct of, say, our biology, because then they would not have to deal with the problem of what uh, Kerstler and others referred to as the ghost in the machine. Consciousness is a ghost, a spook, a phantom that somehow spoils the logic of this perfectly balanced clockwork universe, this worldview that we have created for ourselves. Now, to me, if you're going to try and come up with a new way of talking about
about consciousness, then that is precisely what you need to do. You have to come up with a new way of looking at the basic phenomenon. It will not be scientific. It cannot be scientific. But for me, what it came down to was understanding the world inside our heads, the world of consciousness as a world, as a space, as a kind of space that had its own rules, had its own unique properties, and was just as demonstrably real as the three-dimensional physical space which we inhabit. Starting to consider the nature of that space tends to lead you to consider previous attempts to define consciousness in spatial terms. You could think of Plato with his world of ideal forms, something that exists nowhere in physical reality, but which, according to Plato, must exist, must precede physical reality, must be this world of essences that all material form is merely a kind of distant echo of. There are other ideas. There is uh, Carl Jung's idea of a mass unconscious. Uh, this, again, is a sort of a, a place somewhere within our ancestral memory. There is Karl Popper, who talked of World 3. World 3 is a kind of hypothetical abstract space in which immaterial human constructions, ideologies, for example, Marxism, these are constructs that do not actually have a material form, but are nonetheless important and often sizable mechanisms in the world of ideas. To me, the world inside our heads, I gave it the working label of idea space. I believe that it can be treated as a space and that, yes, just as we each have our own private address in physical space, just as we have our own private house or flat or room, then so too do we have our own private area of consciousness. This is the area that we generally label as ourself. However, if you go outside your flat or house or room, then you'll find that the area beyond its walls is communal. I think this may also be true of the kind of conceptual space that I'm talking about. That if you wander out the back door of your mind and personality, wander down its back alleyways, you might find yourself in a deeper area of that mental space than the one that you are usually accustomed to. You might find that there are different rules which seem to apply in these deeper 